Okay, am I on? Yep. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Will Bailey. I'm an Android engineer at Instagram. And today I'm going to be talking about UI physics and a little library I wrote called Rebound that can help you bring UI physics to your applications. All right, so what are we going to cover today? Well, first of all, I'd like to talk about what do we mean when we talk about UI physics? What is this concept? And then I'd like to explain why you might want to include physics in your application and what value it'll add, both to you as an engineer and to your users. Then I'd like to take the library Rebound uh, as an example of a simple physics library. But I hope the concepts that I'll be discussing will be generalizable so that if you decide to implement your own uh, physics animation library, uh, you'll be able to take some of these tips and tricks and bring them along with you. Okay, so what is UI physics? When I, when I talk about that, it's kind of an abstract concept. And like, how can I, uh, how can I get my head around what, what we're talking about here? All right, so who's familiar with this? Yeah, everybody, right? So my first uh, experiences with computing were playing video games when I was a kid. And when you play a game like Mario, uh, Super Mario Brothers, you quickly learn what he can do. He can run at a certain speed. He can jump. He can collect coins. And if he's not careful, he can fall off a platform and die. And as you're playing the game, you kind of gradually learn this metaphor, this, this sort of real world interaction that Mario is having. Although it's not exactly realistic, it is learnable and it's consistent. And it's also a lot of fun, too. And so as I play more and more games, I can just kind of pick up the games gradually because the environment in the game makes sense. It has a set of rules. It has a, a physical uh, laws that govern the gameplay. Nowadays, people are using software more than ever because we have these tiny com touch-based computers in our pockets. And there's so many different applications that we use. And every day, we're picking up the new hottest app. And there's not necessarily a, a user manual that comes with each of these apps. And so in order for these apps to be easily understood, we need to provide metaphors to the user that help them understand how to navigate and accomplish the tasks that the application is designed for. Integrating a little bit of physics into your UI and taking a cue from game development can bring some, some of that fun discovery process and process of learning how things work and having a consistent metaphor of motion in your application that makes it meaningful and makes the user understand what they're doing sort of intuitively. And so it's a really interesting idea, I think, to take a hint from game development and start to think about how can we use these concepts in other types of applications. So really, when I talk about UI physics, what I'm talking about is to have a model of motion in your application. So think about it as when things move around, there's a consistent set of laws that govern how they move so that actions I take will have expected results and the user will be able to intuitively figure out how to move around in the application. Another interesting concept of having a model of this animation state in your UI or in your application is that you're separating the concerns of animation state from UI presentation. We always think about data models as being an important thing to separate out from our user interface, but animation itself is a piece of state. When a view is in one position or another, that's a piece of state. And using a physics system, you, can, you get a consistent place to store that state that's separate from your views and can actually make it easier for you to program as well as all of the benefits I mentioned about making it more intuitive for the user and more fun. So if we're going to implement physics in a UI, what exactly does that mean concretely? So you could take a couple of different approaches. So you could actually just fake the physics. There could be you know, sort of no uh, real actual uh, underlying model here. And you could just use some time-based interpolators to animate things around. But I hope the rest of this presentation will convince you that there's value in considering uh, using a, a real set of physics equations to govern your UI. And welcome to everybody coming in. Sorry we, we got started. Uh, you haven't missed much yet. <laughs> um, so the next, uh, the next way you might go is you say, well, I'm not going to implement physics at all. You might say, well, OK, I'll go to the other extreme, and I'll implement a full physics engine with you know, collisions and all kinds of constraints and gravity. And this might be really interesting uh, as an engineer 
to think, oh, this is a fun challenge, and how can I make my whole UI governed by physics? But this is probably overkill, both from an engineering perspective and to the user. Imagine you have a launcher, uh, and you have a grid of icons, but because you've designed your whole application to be based on physics, uh, they have to be actually scaffolded in place. They need some sort of support, because gravity is going to cause them to fall to the bottom of the screen. And that's really not, I mean, although that might be entertaining or it might be a fun experiment, it's probably not what is really useful to the user. And it's probably a lot of complexity for you to program as well. So what I think the sweet spot is to sort of build a pseudo-physics interface where there's this natural motion in your UI and there's this consistent set of rules, but we give the user superpowers so that they can't really screw it up. And things kind of go in a meaningful and consistent way rather than just being governed by somewhat of the haphazard randomness that could happen in the real world, you know, when, when uh, you know, trying to actually orchestrate everything as if it was capable of doing anything that a real world object could do. An example of this might be, say you have a, a user interface that presents like a color picker as a swatch of colors that I can fan out. If we went with a full physics engine and I fan that out, in the real world, I might, some of the pages might stick together and I might not actually get the desired effect that I want to actually look at every single color. But if we kind of introduce some magic into this and we give the user the superpower of like this lucky shot where they fan out the swatch, uh, the set of swatches and they see every color, then that's the kind of uh, user interface that we want to have. We want the user to be able to navigate efficiently, but we want them to still have this metaphor of the real world, and we want them to still have this delight of being able to interact with things that feel realistic. Okay, so now that we've talked about um, sort of the approaches you could take, we'll take a really brief detour into physics. Um, I'm not a physicist, and I know just enough of this to get you know, what I need to get done, done. Um, but thinking about some of these physics equations are important if you're actually going to implement something like this. So starting out with Newton's laws of motion. <clears throat> so inertia, the first law says that objects in motion continue to stay in motion unless they're acted on by some opposing force. So in the real world, if I throw a ball, I expect it to keep moving through the air until it runs out of energy um, or wind resistance gradually slows it down and uh, it comes down and, and gravity pulls it to the ground. I would be very surprised if it was flying through the air, stopped dead and just dropped, or stopped dead and just hovered in the air for that matter. Um, sort of having something like that in my interface would be bad too because it would be jarring and confusing to the user. Uh, the next law s explains how uh, mass and acceleration are expressed uh, in force. And so force equals mass times acceleration. So larger objects take more force in order to accelerate. And in order to, applying this law inside of a, a physics library will help you actually maintain the motion that, that should be happening when different forces act on objects. And so you'll need to implement the, this equation into your, into your UI. Uh, but you can also do interesting things where say you had uh, a piece of the interface that was larger and more important. You could model that as having more mass than other elements in your UI, and that might cause it to move more slowly when applied the same force. And this might help explain to the user the importance of that object or that it, you know, it, sh it should be taken seriously. Um, and then the third law is that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And so this can allow you to build sort of constraints around your interface. So say you can throw things around, um, but there's boundaries. And if they hit that boundary, they should either collide with it and compress or bounce off of it. Um, so having, having the ability to have these reactive forces in your UI can also be uh, very useful. OK, so another key thing to think about is springs. And springs are uh, really uh, everywhere when you think about it. Um, a lot of people might say, oh, a spring is just that little metal coil that you see. But really, spring forces or, or flexible, flexible uh, restorative forces are everywhere, from a tree swaying in the breeze and coming back to the buoyancy of water. Lots of things we encounter in the real world have this sort of elasticity to them. And so using springs, you can make your UI um, feel like a real world thing that has this kind of elastic property. And in order to achieve that effect, uh, you use uh, a formula called Hooke's Law. And that's what we have here. And Hooke's Law says that the force exerted by a spring 
is equal to its tension, or how stiff the spring is, acting in opposition to its displacement. So the further away I pull a spring from where it wants to be, the tighter it's going to pull, or the, uh, the more force it's going to exert to pull it back. And so to illustrate that a little bit, here's a little video where I have a simple uh, spring attached to this uh, interface element. And as I press down, I move it from a value of 1 to 0. And if I change the tension of the spring, the tightness coefficient, then it'll move more slowly if I reduce it. If I increase that, it'll move more sharply, and it'll oscillate more frequently given the, uh, given the same amount of friction in the system. And I can make it really tight uh, like that. OK, so now that we understand what UI physics are, um, why do they matter? And I think I've covered a little bit of this. But first of all, I'd like to say realism. Making things feel realistic in your application will make them feel good. Now, you need to be careful that you don't go overboard, like I said, and make things difficult. But just a little bit of physics can make things feel really nice to the user. The next concept is direct manipulation. And direct manipulation is defined as a human-computer interaction style, which involves continuous representation of objects of interest and rapid reversible and incremental actions and feedback. The idea here is that, especially with touch-based applications, when I'm moving things around on the screen, I have a very personal connection with them. And I feel like they should move with my finger. And when I throw things, I feel like they should move with the velocity that I imparted to them. So things feel like they're directly under my control. It makes things more intuitive, and it makes me feel like uh, the application will do what I want it to when I want it to. And a really good example of this is the chat heads feature of Facebook Messenger. With this feature, you can each conversation you have is represented as a circle. And this piece of uh, interface can overlay other applications to allow you to quickly context switch between a conversation uh, with your friends planning a meetup and, say, a map of where you're headed. But this wouldn't work if it was getting in my way. So in order to be able to use this efficiently, I need to be able to move these conversations around and dispose of them whenever I feel like they're getting in the way. And direct manipulation means that I understand that I can just drag this around and throw it, down, throw it into the trash uh, when I'm done with it. Another reason that yeah, UI physics is important is the idea of consistency. So things will move in a consistent way if you just define a consistent set of rules by which they're governed. And this can help the user understand what's going to happen next when they take an action. And then finally, delight. Because things that feel real and authentic can be fun and make your application feel more alive, uh, these things are delightful. And here's a quick example. The original version of the double tap to like animation in Instagram just used a basic time interpolator, and the heart sort of scales up and, and appears. We realized we could make this a lot more fun if we introduced a little bit of spring animation. And so now you see in the, in the updated version, the heart kind of beats. It feels lively. It feels alive. It's not overkill because it's still a pretty quick animation, but it's really a, it gives the user a nice subtle reward for the action they've just taken. So I, I hope this has demonstrated how these concepts of UI physics really complement some of the things Google has laid out in material design. So material design talks about how your application should have authentic motion and the choreography should be consistent. Things that are moving should direct the user through your application in a meaningful way. And there should be delightful details baked in, because that, makes the, that little bit of polish makes the application feel better. And so although they don't talk specifically about using a physics engine in the guidelines, just a little bit of physics can help you accomplish these goals of material design. And one more thing to think about is, as an engineer, aside from the benefits to the user, it gives you this declarative programming model. So rather than thinking about imperatively animating some UI element from one position to another, I can start to think about states. My application should be in one state, and then it should be in another state. And then I want to use the physics system to govern how I move from one state to the next. And this takes a lot of the thinking out of doing these kinds of transitions. If an action gets canceled or redirected, I can just tell it, well, you were on your way to this state, but now you're on your way to this state. And I can think of the physics system as something that will fulfill the promise to me that that state will be achieved in time. And it'll occur in a natural way because the physics system is going to make things move naturally. So it's not just going to abruptly stop and change direction. It's going to sort of overshoot a little bit and then curve back in if there's velocity already that the thing is already moving with. OK, 
So now uh, I'll talk about rebound as an implementation of some of these ideas. Um, and rebound, what it is, is a simple library that accurately models spring dynamics for the purpose of driving physical animations. And this project, or this library, came out of the efforts to build Facebook Home, which was a project at Facebook a couple of years ago to really bring um, social content first and foremost on your phone. And we knew this was a lot to ask for users. Turned out it was a lot to ask. But in building it, in our attempt to make something great for users, we realized that if it was going to be, uh, if it was going to be so prominent that it needed to feel great, and it needed all these concepts that I've just talked about in order for the user to really feel like they're in control. So we worked with a great team of designers, and they used this t uh, tool called Quartz Composer. And Quartz Composer allowed them to create full motion interactive prototypes. So we were given very explicit designs as engineers, build this for me. And when we looked at it, we were like, what they're doing here is they're creating physics-based animations, mostly based on springs. And in this example, if I have a set of notifications on my screen, I can press and hold on them and then toss them all away as a set. So it's a really nice way to clear my notifications in one shot. But it also feels really natural because these things kind of collapse and overshoot a little bit. And so we needed to implement this, and we didn't know quite how to do it. Just for a little bit more context, here's what the finished product looks like. And pretty much every animation in this system is governed by springs. And so everything feels very lifelike and natural. And uh, using this approach, uh, we were pretty satisfied that we had achieved our goal of making the uh, social content first and foremost, but still making it delightful and easy for the user to interact through, interact and get what they want to get done, done. So given that we were building something like this, we had some design goals. Um, first of all, we didn't really think we needed a full physics engine. For one, that would be a lot of a uh, weight to add to our application. And when we looked at what the designers were building with, they were really just using springs. And we realized that most of these animations and most of these things can be done with simple spring forces. Uh, as a library, I wanted it to be lightweight and easy to integrate. I didn't want to make you take on this massive dependency just to get this new animation capability in your UI. And then part of that is focusing on the model rather than the UI. So Rebound provides the physics simulation to you and then gives you callbacks that you use to actually actuate your UI with it. And if you wanted to use something like OpenGL to render, you could do that as well. So it's not opinionated about using Android views per se. Finally, it should be a low-level building block so that if you wanted to, you could build other libraries on top of it, or things like components, um, which I'll show a little bit later. And if you're here for tomorrow, there's a talk from an engineer at Tumblr uh, about a library called Backboard, which wraps Rebound to make certain things uh, easier to do and, and a nicer API uh, for, doing, for connecting gestures to springs and springs to views. So I'd highly recommend checking that out. So because I kept this library really simple, I'd say it's more interesting as a pattern than as a framework. And that's why I hope this is sort of the concepts that I'm going to go through here are generalizable if you're trying to build your own uh, physics UI into your application. So Rebound can help you build all kinds of things. Delightful transitions, pagers, toggles, scrollers, anything where you want natural feeling motion with sort of goal-driven behavior because it's a spring seeking to a target value. And here's one kind of crazy example from a project I worked on called Slingshot. Um, this was a really fun app. It was kind of targeted at teenagers. And so we wanted a lot of lightweight and delightful animations. So in this case, we have a cascading animation where each item in the list follows the next. And this might be overkill for you know, a more grown-up application, but we wanted something really fun. So uh, having these kinds of fun uh, transitions can really just add to the delight of your app if that's kind of the experience you're going for. OK, so how about we look at a quick little bit of code. Here is the basics of how you implement a spring animation with Rebound. So you start out by creating a spring system. And a spring system will hold a set of springs. Inside of that spring system, you can create as many springs as you want. And these are the models that will govern your animation. And springs are going to be, by default, at rest at position 0. But by calling set end value 1, you trigger uh, the spring system to start solving. So that spring is going to start moving to this new goal. And it, depending on the coefficients for tension and friction that you've added, it may overshoot or it may just stop dead. 
Um, but as it's moving, it's going to be calling back to its listeners. And the listeners can then take actions in your UI. So in this case, I'm using that 0 to 1 transition of the spring, and I'm interpolating it into a scale of 0.5 to 1. So I'm scaling my view. And this is similar to the example I showed earlier, where uh, triggering a, a change in state of the spring just triggers a, tar a scale animation. So the core API of Rebound is a spring system uh, that manages springs. Both of these things can be listened to, and then some utilities. And the spring system, like I said, maintains a set of springs. It gives you hooks before and after each integration pass, so you can apply global constraints on all of the springs. It's driven by a looper, so it automatically starts solving as soon as any of the springs go out of equilibrium. And it allows for you to run the simulation either in real time or to pre-play pre it uh, using a tight loop and a fixed time step. And this can allow you to create uh, reusable spring curves that you could build into interpolators that are, that are based on durations. A spring is the core thing you're going to be dealing with. It's the model of motion. And it accepts uh, a set of listeners that give you information about the state changes the spring is going through. It also accepts the configuration object that defines what the tension and friction of the spring is going to be. And finally, you can also impart it with initial velocity. So if you have a continuous gesture that ends in a fling, you can set the velocity on that spring at that moment, and then it'll start moving with that initial velocity as it starts to track to whatever its goal is. The listeners that you have for springs tell you when it starts to move on spring activate, anytime the value changes in, in on spring update, and whenever it comes to rest in on spring at rest. And anytime you change the end or target value of the spring, you'll get on spring end state change. And then a spring system, like I said, gives you uh, a callback before and after each pass of the integration loop. And here's how these things fit together just uh, as a diagram. Uh, you have a spring system holding springs. Both can be listened to. Springs are configured with spring configs. And those are stored in a registry that you can access globally. And this can allow you to live tune springs at runtime, which I'll show in a moment. And then a spring looper is what drives the spring system and provides real-time simulation based on the choreographer or a fallback polyfill if you're on pre-Jelly Bean. And then it also provides a synchronous and a stepping looper, which can allow you to play sets of keyframes uh, or play through the whole thing in a tight loop. These can be useful if you want to generate pre-can curves or write unit tests or ship off batches of frames to some other thread to do some animation there. The utilities, like I said, spring config that gives you tension and friction, spring util, provide some math uh, for doing things like inter linear interpolation between ranges and clamping. And then the choreographer compat polyfills choreographer on older uh, pre-Jelly Bean devices. And then there's a couple of other fun utilities on top. The spring configurator view is this thing that allows you to live tune the behavior of springs at runtime. And then animation queue and spring chain are higher level components built on top of springs that allow you to create cascading effects. So here's a quick example of a spring configurator view in action. So I have this list view that I can scroll with a bit of overshoot. And if I want to change the amount of behavior or the amount of bounce in it, I can just reduce the friction a bit. And now when I scroll, I'll get more of an oscillation on the spring. And so I could give this uh, prototype to a designer, and they could play with that value until it felt just perfect to them. And I don't have to keep recompiling the app uh, every time they want to change that value a little bit. Uh, spring chain can allow you to do these fun cascading animations like I showed in the other uh, slide. And this was actually inspired by a feature of Facebook's uh, iPhone app paper, um, where you could actually navigate by dragging lists like this, and they would sort of all cascade behind. It was a really um, nice flourish. It might be overkill, but if you're going for some really like gestural interfaces, it could be a lot of fun to include. OK, so let's go through a quick set of comparative examples just to show what animation in Rebound looks like versus doing the same, a similar type of animation using built-in APIs from the Android SDK. So I'm going to use this contrived example of throwing a dart at a dartboard. And this is just some boilerplate code that gives me some basic touch handling to grab and fling the dart. So here's my first example. Um, I'm just going to call this naive animator. And I'm going to get a reference to my dart view. I'm going to say animate, set an interpolator. I'm just going to pick a linear interpolator. And then I'm going to say that it should translate to its goal, which is the center of the target. 
And then I'm just going to pick some duration because that's required. And I'll just pick 500 milliseconds. So what happens is I'm throwing the dart and it gets to the target, but it doesn't continue with the velocity that I threw it at. And that just feels jarring to me as a user. And um, although you, know, you could say, well, it's obvious why that's happening. You just picked an arbitrary duration. It's surprising to me how many applications I see doing this. And it always takes me out of the experience when my gesture doesn't feel like it was continuous. It felt like some, um, some other animation process took over after I finished directly manipulating the object. So we can definitely do better. Um, we can improve that by implementing this method duration to goal with velocity. And that method will uh, make my dart move with the same velocity by calculating the number of milliseconds that the animation should use for its duration. So you can definitely work around this, but if you're doing a lot of animation in your UI, this is exactly where integrating a, a little bit of physics uh, can provide consistency and take some of the work out of doing it for you and also give you even more natural feeling effects. So I would say if you find that you're writing a lot of methods like that, step back and think about, is there a better way to solve this problem? Okay, and then there's another way you could do this in Android too. You could use a scroller, and a scroller actually has a little physics simulation inside of it. And so what this does is I'm actually kicking off a scroller with the velocity that I fling with, and I'm invalidating until the scroller runs out of energy. And with this, I can throw with velocity and hit the target, but I'm not guaranteed to hit the target because the scroller can die before it reaches it. And so although this might be the case in the real world where I'm throwing a dart and I just miss or I don't throw it hard enough, if we're building uh, an interface for a user where we want to give them these superpowers, these magical ability to always get the lucky shot, we need some kind of goal-seeking behavior to guarantee that they're going to hit that target, but we still want it to move with natural feeling motion. So this is where rebound can come in because rebound has springs and springs have target values. So in this example, on my fling, I'm just gonna do a couple things. I can configure my spring to not overshoot, so when it hits the target, it just sticks in the target and it doesn't bounce. Um, then I can set the velocity on it to be the velocity that I threw with, and then I can uh, set the end value to be the goal that I'm going for, the center of the target. And with that, I'll always hit the target. But notice the, the dart is actually accelerating towards the target, and that's because the spring has some tension in it. And I can tune that value uh, so that it's a little or a lot, depending on how I want it to behave. But with this, it'll be guaranteed to hit the target. Now, I don't have to do that, though. I can actually make a spring work like a scroller. And this is a really interesting trick, where if I give the spring no tension, then it's just going to behave like an inertial decay. So it's actually just a model of that movement that is eventually going to run out of energy. So as I throw, I set a coasting behavior, and then... Uh, when I throw, it's not guaranteed to hit the target. It'll just eventually coast to a halt. And when I showed that scrolling example previously, that's exactly how that worked. I fling the list. It scrolls until it runs out of energy. I'm checking to see where the position is. And if it overshoots one of its boundaries, then I can tell it, oh, now you're out of bounds. So set your end value to take you back into bounds. And then the spring will elastically pull the scroll view back into the correct position. OK, so that's a comparative example. Now I'd like to show a few quick techniques that are really cool. And I think some of these would apply whether or not you're using Rebound or some other animation library. So this is kind of what I was just talking about. A spring with zero tension can model inertial decay. So here's an example where I have a Rebound-based view pager. And as I'm scrolling through this list of views, uh, I can see that it's going to coast to a halt. And this is all, all the animation in here is driven by a spring where I'm flinging it. But the inertial decay happens and it comes to a rest um, as it, once it runs out of energy. Another interesting idea is to think of springs as just toggles. So they're just states. They're either 0 or 1. And then you can take that 0 to 1 transition and interpolate it across a variety of ranges. So in this example, I'm doing a couple of things. I'm interpolating a radius, an alpha, a stroke width, distance, and a color based on a, a, a simple 0 to 1 transition. And with that, I can take one spring and make this ridiculous animation um, that really illustrates some of the power of material design. OK. Um, and another cool thing you can do is you can use springs to indirectly manipulate views. And this is more of a, uh, this is a value to the programmer. So like I said earlier, the spring is the model of motion in your application. And I can stop thinking about directly accessing my views and trying to figure out what state they're in 
and I can keep that state separate in the model, and my views can become more functions over that model state, which is a lot easier to think about. And so imagine you had like an interface with some contention in it, and one, uh, a user gesture may interrupt some animation or some uh, event may fire asynchronously that triggers a state change in the UI. Rather than having to like try to access that view and figure out if it's animating and if it should immediately stop or if it should sort of rebound a bit and before it comes to a, before it changes direction, I can just update the state of the physics model, say the spring should be here or it should be here, and then let the physics model figure out the how. I just think about the state, the what I want to happen rather than the how. A really uh, useful thing that's sort of implied by all these other things is using a common spring to converge multiple animations. So here's an example from Instagram's gallery picker. We have this preview and we have a grid of icons below it. And when I select an icon in the grid, uh, which I can expand, the preview slides down to reveal it and the grid view actually scrolls up so that item is at the top of the list. And these are actually two different animations but we want them to feel like one continuous motion. If they were occurring on different animation loops, the, it would feel jarring, as I, as I did in the initial prototype. You'd see this slide down, and this thing scroll up, and it'd feel like some kind of weird Rube, Rube Goldberg contraption that's slightly broken. Um, but if they move together, it feels like one uh, consistent animation, and it feels good, and it's, you just don't think about it. It just feels natural. Finally, uh, you can use Spring System Listener to apply constraints globally. So if I have a set of springs governing the motion of something like this pinch pan image view, where I have a spring governing the X position, a spring governing the Y position, and a spring governing the scale, um, I can wait until after an integration pass has occurred, look at the set of springs, and say, are any of these out of bounds? And if they are, I just need to then say, well, you need to go back into your boundaries. And the scale and the, and the translation could, you, you could achieve the goal of getting them back into bounds through either, so you need to look at the whole set in order to implement something like this. One final uh, thing I'd like to mention is that uh, if you're interested in using Rebound uh, specifically, it's integrated with this design tool called Origami, which is based on Quartz Composer that I mentioned earlier. And our designers at Facebook and Instagram use this to create really interactive prototypes that we can use to review with product managers and understand what we're building uh, and, and facilitate conversations between designers and engineers about how things should work. And Origami includes this feature now called Code Export. And Code Export will actually generate some basic scaffolding code that you can use to kickstart your uh, process of communicating that design to the engineer. And if you choose Android or web, the code export is based on rebounds. So there's actually a JavaScript port of it as well. If you choose iOS, it'll use this library called Pop, which implements a similar set of spring animations. So this is what you get when you do a code export for Android from Origami. It's not meant to be production code. You're not meant to build your whole app this way. It's meant to start a conversation between you and the designer about how you're going to implement this uh, animation and make sure you understand what the motion should feel like. So with this, all you have to do is plug in a few views to your layout, and you'll immediately have that animation running with some basic touch handling. Um, once you have that, then you can take it, throw it away, or you can build out on it, or do whatever you want, but you'll have something in concrete to play with in your hands. So now, uh, some future plans for the library. Um, I'd like to get some of these components that I've built open sourced. Um, and also get more contributions from the community there. There have been some on, on GitHub. Um, I'd like to continue working on this process for integrating uh, design tooling with uh, this library so that the flow from design to finished build is even more smooth. And I'd like to work on more examples of how this is complementary of material design and show that this can be really, a, fill sort of a missing uh, part of material design for you. If this has sparked any interest in the library for you, um, please go check out the code at facebook.github.io slash rebound. If you want to include it in your project, it's available on Maven, and you can include it with one line of Gradle. Um, if you're doing web development, there's a, there's a JavaScript port as well. And uh, this is actually used in some pretty cool products uh, that I've seen on the web. And also, uh, in general, there's some other libraries if you're just interested in physics animation in general that I'd highly recommend checking out. Gravitas is extracted from this game Letterplex, 
And it's a similar scope, although it does a few more things than Rebound does. Um, there's a backboard, which there's going to be a talk on tomorrow, which is an API around Rebound to make connecting gestures to springs and springs to views uh, really simple and uh, provide a really nice declarative API for that. And then there's uh, Pop, if you're doing iOS development. Pop is sort of the iOS equivalent. Um, it has a different API right now. Uh, but it does the same kind of spring animation. And there's also a Swift port of Rebound as well, if, uh, which has the exact same API as Rebound. So if you're, if you're doing iOS, you can check that out. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And I don't know if we have time for questions or what we're supposed to do now, but yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, uh, what are my thoughts on principle for Mac? So I actually work with a designer that uses a mixture of design tools. Sometimes he uses Quartz Composer and Origami. Other times he uses principle. Um, yeah, he, he, sometimes he develops with Framer. There's a lot of things out there. A lot of these things have this kind of spring animation in them, and I think they're good tools for designers to be able to communicate their intent really clearly to engineers. Um, the only one that I've built like a direct mapping of, so the, the constants that you use are exactly the same, is origami. But um, I think we could definitely build something for a uh, principle that would do the same thing, and that would be really cool. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what you could do, so the question is, can you do a time-based animation with rebound? So the idea is that it's a physics deterministic uh, library. So you don't exactly know when it's going to finish. But what you can do is you can use the synchronous looper to pre-generate a set of keyframes. And then you can use that keyframe set as an interpolator. And then that interpolator can have a duration. So I could actually create a pre-canned curve that then I could play that would bounce. It wouldn't necessarily be an accurate spring model but it would give you that feeling of a bouncy animation. And it could potentially be more performant because you're not actually doing any math, you're just playing through a set of predefined values. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Well, you can, you can tune the values. Oh, so the question is if you want to make sure that it stops at exactly a certain amount of time. You can actually tune the values of your spring to be very tight or have a very uh, wide tolerance for when it's at rest. And you can use that to sort of make sure that it doesn't like oscillate for too long or it finishes like pretty close to when you expect it to. Yeah. Um, do we have any more time or? Oh, okay, I think I've got to cut it off. I'll be around. Uh, I'll be over at Instagram, Facebook booth or after this if you have any questions.